The title is Those People. We all have them, do we not? If I say those people, do, does anybody in here know who I'm talking about? Those people, yes. Those other drivers. George Carlin said it best when he said this. Have you ever noticed that anybody driving slower than you is an idiot? And anyone going faster than you is a maniac? Those people, yes. Sometimes politicians are those people. I hesitate to say sometimes, but anyway. How about even this one? Officials at the Packer game. <laughs> They're those people sometimes, aren't they? You know, the list goes on and on, and it changes depending upon the situation that we're in. Because some days those people are those people, and some days those people are those people. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm talking? You know who I'm talking about, do you not? So, how do we interact with them? That's the question we need to answer today. So let's pray. Father in heaven, once again, I don't have anything much to say, but you do. Help me get out of the way and let you do what you do best. Speak to our hearts this morning. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus ends up being the character in our unexpected story today. Do you know, if I look back through the weeks that Don was talking about unexpected stories, it seems like he sneaks in there a lot, does he not? He's our example. It's why, if you ever think about it, it's why he was here for the 33 years he was here. So we would have an example to follow. Because if you think about it, you know, he could have came and, you know, when he was five years old, they could have crucified him and it would have been a blood sacrifice. But you know what? For those first five years, we might not have had a great example. But you know what? He gives us great examples throughout the Gospels. So he is our example we're going to be talking about today. And we're going to take a look at two different situations where Jesus interacted with those people. Okay? The first one is from John chapter, and the first one is, you probably already know about this one, but what did Jesus say to the woman caught in adultery? The, thank you, perfect. Oh man, that is what everybody always says. Let's see what he actually, let's see what it actually says in John chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. Now this is a version, you know, there's different versions of the Bible. This might be a little different version than the one you have, but just bear with me, okay? Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, That's because they are sinners like you. What you need to do is confess your sin, turn from it, and say the sinner's prayer. By the way, I don't condemn you. There's another verse we want to talk about of some of those other people. Hang in there with me. There's a reason. All right. In Luke chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, we hear Jesus interacting with a little man. A wee little man was he. Do we know who we're talking about? That's the guy. And it says this. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus. You are a chief tax collector and have taken excess taxes from your people and in so doing have become a great sinner. Right now, say the sinner's prayer, then come down so I can stay at your house today. It's a little different version. A little different version. However, and let me just bring this point up. Sometimes that is how the world thinks we read those verses because of the way that we interact with those people. It's the way that we come across to them. In their book, Unchristian, David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons surveyed, used research from the Barner Group of a young people aged 16 to 29. They asked them, what word describes Christians? The number one word or phrase, they, they put it that way. The number one was anti-homosexual. 91% of the outsiders of these young people 
said that ant, we were anti-homosexual. The, of the church-going young people, 80% of them said that. The second thing they said was Christians are judgmental. Outsiders said 87%. 87% of those surveyed said Christians are judgmental. Of the church-going young people, 52% said we're judgmental. And if you look in the book on Christian, when they're talking about judgmental, they're saying outsiders think of Christians as quick to judge others. They doubt that we really love people as we say we do. At the beginning of the chapter on judgmental, there is a quote by a young man by the name of Jeff. He is 25 years old, and this is what he says. Christians talk about hating sin and loving sinners. But the way they go about things, they might as well call it what it is. They hate the sin and the sinner. That's what they're thinking of Christians. You know, we need to take a look at those two verses again and see how Jesus talked about it in those verses. Because in John chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, it actually says this. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, first thing he said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. You know, I ask people what Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, and it's exactly what you all said. Go and sin no more. That's what we remember he said. It is not the first thing he told her. The first thing he told her was, neither do I condemn you, because he wanted her to know that he loved her above all else, first off. And then he said, go and sin no more. Sometimes we think we're, we have the right to be able to say that, but you know what? He did have the right to say, go and sin no more, because he never sinned. I don't know about you, but I have no right to tell anyone, go and sin no more. Okay? I'm confessing right now. And I'm, I'm sorry, but, you know, I'm talking about those people today. I have those people sometimes. Because I, you know, I'm like interacting. I'm like, oh, my God. All right? How about the other one? When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. For my, I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Did you hear anything in Jesus' interaction with Zacchaeus that told him anything about him being a sinner or a tax collector or anything else? Sometimes when we interact with those people, we feel it's our duty to tell them about their sin, to tell them about the way that they're living. It's not right with God. You know what? They know. Most of them know that. We don't have to tell them. The order that Jesus interacted with those people was backwards from the way the church has sometimes done it. Because sometimes, you see, the church wants to tell people, wants to make sure that they understand this whole thing about sin. Jeez, look at the way they're living. They're living like they know. They don't know the truth yet. Why do we think that they should live according to the Bible's truths when they're not aware of what they are? Jesus always saw the people first. We sometimes see their sin before we see them, so we think we need to tell them about it. Right? I have been in conversation with people. When I say what we need to do is love them, because that's what Jesus told us. They're like, yeah, but shouldn't we still tell them? I'm not quite sure that that's how it works. Because you see, in our passage today, that that's not our job. Our job is this. In John 16, chapter 7, uh, it's not our job. It's somebody else's. Verses 7 to 11. It says this, nevertheless. I, I looked at that. It was the first word. And I remember doing a whole sermon on nevertheless. We're not going there. Okay. But nevertheless... I tell you the truth. That's Jesus, all right? He says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For, I do, for if I do not go away, 
the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Telling people about their sin is not my responsibility. It is not your responsibility unless, of course, you decide to take the job of the Holy Spirit. So if you want to jump in on that one, go right ahead. I'm not getting there, all right? But we think that it's our job to let people know that they're living in sin. And it's really tempting to do it when we deal with those people. It's not a responsibility. We need to remember that our role in sharing the gospel, I'm not saying that we're not letting people know about sin, okay? We're not talking about just that. But our role in sharing the gospel comes from Jesus himself. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Number one. And what's the second one? Love your neighbor as yourself. And then, of course, right after that, he said, but you can go ahead and tell them about that. No. We get that, we get that love, your neighbor, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. But, where's the but? There's no but in there, okay? All we got to do is love them. That's sharing the gospel. The good news is God loves you. If you haven't heard that before, by the way, I'm going to tell you this. God loves you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter if you've been one of those people that those Christians always talked against, God loves you. You know the people that walk around with a sign that God says God hates, whatever it is after that? They don't know the scriptures. No matter how much they think they do, there is never a time when it says God hates anybody. He loves you. He gave his son for you. He loves you. I don't think I can say that enough. And you know what? Sometimes we think we got to do something more than just loving them. Loving them is enough. Loving each other is enough. He didn't ask us to do more than that, did he? Did he ever? He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I tell you what. I like living in this time because we got two things Jesus said we had to do. How many things did they have back in the Old Testament to do? Do you remember? I think it's somewhere around 673 rules or something. Somewhere in the 600s. I don't remember the exact number. Holy cow. (laughs) We only got two. I can handle that. The best example I can give you of loving someone into a relationship with Christ is a woman by the name of Rosaria Butterfield. I don't know if you've heard of her. Rosaria Butterfield wrote a book called The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. She was an associate professor at Syracuse University. She was a joint teaching in the Center for Women's Studies. She was in a lesbian relationship. She owned two homes. She was the coordinator of the welcoming committee at a Unitarian Universalist church. She was doing some work for her school, her studies, whatever it was. She wrote a critique of Promise Keepers and published it in the local newspaper. As you might imagine, she received hate mail. She received fan mail. She actually had boxes on both sides of her desk This is the hate mail, this is the fan mail, this is it. And so that's what she did until she got to a letter from a guy by the name of Pastor Ken Smith. She got a letter from him that was kind and inquiring. He started asking her questions, saying, maybe, you know, what did you do? How did you 
research this. Where, what were your presuppositions when you did this? When you wrote this article, what were you thinking? Do you believe in God? What do you think about? He was asking her these questions. And she took the letter and she said, hate mail? No. Fan mail? No. What should I? And she had it on her desk and she kept going back to it over and over again and reading it and wondering what was going on with this Christian pastor that wasn't condemning her. She's like, I, I don't know how to handle this. But Pastor Ken Smith and his wife Floyd ended up befriending her, asking her a lot of questions and answering a lot of her questions about the faith. They were interested in Rosaria just because God loved her and they wanted to befriend her, not convert her. Did you hear what I just said? They wanted to befriend her, not convert her. Because Pastor Ken and Floyd knew it was not their job to tell Rosaria about her sin. Their job was to love her. And if you have a chance, you got to get that book and read about her, I think she calls it a train wreck conversion. Seriously. This woman started getting into and digging into the Bible because Ken and his wife were asking her questions. She started questioning and she said she came face to face with the reality and she met Jesus Christ. For you see, when it comes down to it and you meet him, all the arguments end up kind of vanishing and just disappearing. Because he never was interested in trying to convert everybody. He was interested in loving people. If you start looking at what Jesus did, go through the four Gospels. He wasn't hanging out at church. He was out with those people all the time. And he got in trouble for it. <laughs> Boy, did he. He got in trouble for it. John Marx wrote a book called Reasons to Believe, One Man's Journey Among the Evangelicals and the Faith He Left Behind. The church's response to Hurricane Katrina turned the corner for, for him and became a key reason for him to believe. For you see, years after the hurricane and long after federal assistance had dried up, a network of churches in surrounding states, was still sending regular teams to help rebuild houses. Did we hear about that? Did we hear about that in the news? No, not really, not really. Marx writes in his book, I would argue that this was a watershed moment in the history of American Christianity. Nothing spoke more eloquently to believers and to non-believers who were paying attention than the success of a population of believing volunteers measured against the massive and near total collapse of secular government efforts. The storm laid bare an unmistakable truth. The truth is that God loves each one of us, those people included. You see, all those volunteers were showing the world that God loved them. They were not down there pointing out anything other than they, they didn't have an agenda. They just said, we need to go help people. And this was a wide variety of people. Deep Cajuns, Southern people, black people, white it didn't matter. It didn't matter what religion they were. Their Christians came in and said, hey, we need to help each other. We need to show these people God's love. And they did it. We can do that. When we deal with those people, okay, we, get, we need to look at Jesus' example, yes. 
But I want us to all remember this quote from a book called The Cross in the Closet. The author author said this, and I'm going to close with this. That same spirit teaches us to leave the finger pointing to someone far more capable and to love sacrificially and completely without motive or thought of personal gain. Can we do that, church? Can we remember that the finger pointing is the Holy Spirit's job? Our job is to love sacrificially. Let's pray. Father in heaven, so often those people are in our line of fire. Father, so often we do not understand those people. (laughs) But you do. You love them so much that you sent your son to die for them as well as us. Father, there is no those people. We were once those people. We sometimes still are those people. Forgive us. Please. Father, we love you. Help us to just channel the love that you pour into our lives to each and every person that we meet. Not just on Sunday morning. Not just when we're feeling really good. But on those days when we seem to run into those people everywhere. We need your help. We need your guidance. We need the power of your Holy Spirit in our life to do that. And help us just to know them, to love them, and let you do the rest. We pray it all in Jesus.